books gave me from audiences of all different kinds in many different countries. So what happened? What happened to that little girl? And it wasn't anything I planned. I was very shy. I think if I thought back then, when I was young, that this was going to happen to me, I might have decided, well, I'm not going down that road. <laughs> I, but I did, because I didn't know. And so, you know what's happened? The only way I can cope with this, there are two James. There's this one, just me, just an ordinary person talking to you, who's had some lucky breaks in her life. And then there's the icon. You kind of greeted an icon. And that's an icon that's come from the National Geographic and Discovery Channel and various articles and books and so on. So here's the thing. This Jane, me talking to you now, I have to try and keep up with that icon out there. <laughs> So anyway, how did it begin? And I credit to a very large extent the success that I've had on the way my mother raised me. Some of you, and I hope many of you, had a support, had supportive parents when you were young. Goodness, it makes a difference. As I say, I was born loving animals and I was so lucky to have a supportive mother. When I was one and a half, she came into my room I found I'd taken a whole handful of earthworms into bed with me. <laughs> she didn't get mad at me. She just said, Jane, I think they might die if you leave them here. And we, we took them back into the garden. But then a very, very, to me, very significant thing happened when I was four years old. We lived in London in the city, not many animals there for an animal loving little girl. And mum took me for a holiday in the country. And it was onto a farm, a proper farm, where animals were out in the fields, not one of these terrible factory farms. And I was given a job to help collect the hen's eggs. The hens pecked around in the farmyard, but they mostly laid their eggs in these little hen houses where they also slept at night to keep them safe from the foxes. And I was collecting the eggs and Apparently, and I don't remember, but I began asking everybody, but where's the hole on the hen big enough for an egg to come out? <laughs> well, nobody could explain it to me. What I do remember is seeing the hen, she was brown, and she went into one of these hen houses, and I must have thought to my little four-year-old mind, ah, she's going to lay an egg. So I crawled after her. Well, that was a mistake. Uh, then your head, you don't want four-year-old children crawling off you. And she was probably terrified. And she came out with squawks, I suppose, of fear. So again, in that little four-year-old mind, I must have worked out, no hen will lay an egg here. There's something frightening in this hen house. <laughs> and so, but I was on the road to discovery. I wasn't going to give up. And I went into an empty hen house. Apparently, I waited around four hours. Nobody knew where I was, and my mother had just called the police. It was getting dark, and then she sees this excited little girl running towards the house, and instead of getting mad at me, how dare you go off without telling us, don't you dare do it again, she saw my shining eyes and sat down to hear the wonderful story of how a hen lays an egg. And I don't know who was more excited, me, or the hen. <laughs> anyway, so I tell that story for a reason. Because there you see the making of a little scientist, the curiosity, asking questions, not getting the right answer, deciding to find out for yourself, making a mistake, not giving up, and learning patience. It was all there. And a different kind of mother might have crushed that early scientific curiosity and I might have not have done what I've done. So it can be a father, but my father had joined the war in World War II. So it was my mother and my grandmother who really were the inspirations when I was growing up. Mom decided that I'd learned to read more quickly. She got books about animals. 
So I remember many books about animals. There was no TV back then. And Dr. Doolittle, oh, how I longed to learn the language of animals like he did. I wanted a parrot like Polynesia to teach me animal languages. And when I was about eight, I pretended to my friends I could understand when the dogs barked and the cats meowed and the birds sang. And they believed me. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was when I was 10 years old, right in the heart of World War II, and I had a few pennies of pocket money every week. I saved them up. The books mostly came from the library because we couldn't afford new books. And on this occasion, I was spending my Saturday afternoon, as I usually did, in this little second-hand bookshop. And there was a little book. I could just afford it. It was only this big, a very cheap edition, Tarzan of the Apes. Well, I took it home. I took it up my favorite tree in the garden. I read it. And of course, you know, little girls of 10 can be very romantic. And I felt passionately in love with this glorious Lord of the Jungle. <laughs> and what did Tarzan do? He married the wrong Jane. <laughs> yeah, he did. Well, I knew there wasn't a Tarzan, but that began my dream. I will go to Africa, I will live with wild animals, and I will write books about them. No thought of being a scientist, because women weren't that sort of scientist back then. In fact, they were seldom any kind of scientist. That was for men. And so they laughed at me. Oh, how will you get to Africa? You don't have money. Um, it's far away. It's filled with dangerous animals and cannibals, and, and you're just a girl. But not mum. She said, Jane, if you want to do something like this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity, and if you don't give up, hopefully you find a way. And that's a message I've taken all around the world, particularly to young people in disadvantaged communities. And I wish mum was around to know how many people have said to me, Jane, thank you, because you taught me, because you did it. I can do it too. So that was the beginning of it all. <laughs> that was the beginning of it all. And I was good at school. I came second or third in every almost every exam. But I didn't have enough money for university. I had to get a job. I did a secretarial uh, training, boring, you know, shorthand typing, bookkeeping, that sort of thing. But I set my mind to do it well. I got my diploma. I got a job in London, interesting one actually, with documentary films. But then came the opportunity, a letter from a school friend inviting me to Kenya, where her parents had bought a farm. So I couldn't save money in London where my job was. So I went home and to save up money, I worked as a waitress in a hotel around the corner. Jolly hard work. It took, I don't know, five, maybe even six months. And finally, I had enough of a return fare to Africa. In those days, we went by boat. There were some planes that were very expensive. So it was a four-week journey. So exciting. All the way around Africa, the Suez Canal was closed because of a war with Egypt. And it was exciting, you know, the water got warmer and bluer, and there was a flying fish, and then there were dolphins. But the first place we stopped was Cape Town. Some of you may know that iconic table hunting. And it was so exciting. My mother had some friends there, and they said, we'll look after Jane while the ship is in dock for two, two days while it refuels. And they took me around, and it was, it was just, I was in Africa. I was there, I was in Africa. But then it was the height of apartheid. And I realized that, that on the back of the hotel were these words in Afrikaans, six blanks, white people only. I wasn't brought up that way. I, my grandfather was a congregational minister. I didn't judge people by the color of their skin. And so I couldn't wait to leave. When I got to Kenya, it was better. Kenya was on the very brink 
of independence from British colonial rule. It's a very different atmosphere. I was fortunate to hear about Dr. Lewis Leakey, famous paleontologist, anthropologist. Somebody said, Jane, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Lewis. So I went to meet him at the Natural History Museum. He was curator. He took me all around. He asked me hundreds of questions. And I think that he was impressed by how much I knew, even though I'd just arrived from England, because I spent hours in the Natural History Museum in London when I worked there, and I'd read every book I could about African animals. There wasn't much back then. And so, amazingly, that boring old secretarial course, Lewis Leakey had just lost his secretary, and he needed a secretary, and there I was. <laughs> so, yes, you never know, do you? You never know when what you do may turn out to be just the very thing that's important, even though at the time you didn't realize it. So, there I was, surrounded by people who could answer all my questions, about the mammals and the birds and the reptiles and the amphibians and the insects and the plants. And they were wonderful, wonderful months. And it was when I was with him at Alderby Gorge where he was searching for the fossils of early humans, which of course was his role in life, that he noticed that I seemed to behave pretty well if I met animals and there were so many animals then around Old Avaya and Serengeti. And I think it was around the campfire the day when I'd come almost face to face with a young male lion. And Leakey, Leakey said, Jane, you behaved exactly right. So there I am sitting around the campfire and he starts talking about a group of chimpanzees in a place called Tanganyika. Tanganyika it was back then. And they were on the shore of a lake and he wanted somebody to go and study them. And he said this for several days, and in the end I said, oh, Lewis, I wish you'd stop talking about this, because you know that's just what I want to do. And he said, why do you think I'm talking to you about it? <laughs> well, it took a year for him to find the money. I mean, I hadn't been to college. I'd just come from England. So I went back to England while he <coughs> searched for money and finally found um, a wealthy American philanthropist who said, okay, money for six months, we'll see how she does. Well, it was really exciting and I arrived at Gombe. I was actually with my mother, not because I needed mummy, but because the authorities refused for me to be alone and mum volunteered to come. And actually she, it was amazing that she was there. She started a little clinic for the local people they came to trust us. It started me off with really good relations with all the local fishermen along the lake, because Gombe's on the edge of Lake Tanganyika. And <clears throat> she boosted my morale because for four whole months, the chimps took one look at this weird white ape and ran away. <laughs> They'd never seen such a thing before. She, she said, Jane, you're finding out more than you know. You find this peak and through your binoculars. Oh, he thinks I need a sip of water. Thank you. <laughs> I do. And do you know why? Because I do so much lecturing, so much talking, that my voice suffers. So cheers, everybody. <laughs> water doesn't do the trick. <laughs> Joe knows that. He chose to bring me water. Anyway, thank you, Joe. <laughs> so there I am, and it was very sad that mum left just two weeks before the breakthrough observation. And that was when I saw one chimp who'd begun to lose his fear of me. I called him David Greybeard because he had white hair on his chin. He was very handsome. And I saw him this very special morning, a oh, hand reaching out, picking stems of grass, pushing them down into holes in a termite mound, pulling them out, picking off the termites with his lips. I saw him picking leafy twigs, and before he could use those as tools to fish for termites, he had to carefully remove the leaves. So David Graybeard is using and making
tools, something which would not be at all exciting these days. We now know that a number of animals use tools and some make them, but back then science maintained only humans used and made tools. And it was that observation that enabled Leakey to go to the National Geographic Society and they agreed to provide money when my six months ran out. So now I could go back to Gombe and relax. And because of David, I was able to get closer and closer to the other chimps. He was sort of, he was a, a leader. The other chimps trusted him. And because he didn't run away, when I approached a group in which he was sitting or something, they were ready to run, but they looked from him to me and I suppose they thought, oh, she can't be so dangerous after all. So gradually I got to know them as individuals, such vivid personalities. David Greybeard, his close friend, the top ranking male Goliath, the young ambitious Mike, the old female Flo, a real, really the most sexually attractive female we've ever known, <laughs> even though she was quite old and to human eyes, not very, not very attractive. And her daughters, Fifi, her daughter Fifi, her son Stephen and Bigger, and crusty old JB and Mr. McGregor, all that amazing cast of characters I got to know as well as my own family. I got to know how like us they are. They kiss, embrace, hold hands, pat one another, male swagger, they put on a ferocious skull, they may raise their fist. And doesn't that remind you of some human politicians? <laughs> I did not say a name. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I love watching the relationship of mothers with their offspring. <clears throat> How, you know, a female has her first baby at, when she's about 12 or 13, and then she only has a child every five years, and the older child remains dependent, on, so, so emotionally dependent on the mother when the new baby is born. And even the 10 or 12 year old still spends lots of time with mom. In fact, one completely adult male of about 25 years old took along his old mother when he went on a consort ship, a sexual relationship with a female. <laughs> mom tagged along. So, anyway, this was fascinating to me. A long childhood, and I think that's important for chimps, just as it is for humans because they have a lot to learn. And they learn by watching, imitating, and practicing. And I thought, well, uh, you know, they watch the tool using behavior, and we discovered other ways that chimps use tools. So maybe in different parts of Africa, chimps use different tools. The young ones learn by observation, practice. So chimps probably have culture. And all of this was anathema to the scientific community. I know that because after I'd been with the chimps about two years, I got a letter from Leakey saying, uh, Jane, I chose you because you had not been to university because the scientific community has a very reductionist attitude to animals. And I wanted somebody whose mind wasn't biased. But now, he said, now I want other scientists to take you seriously. So you have to get a degree and we have no time for you to get an undergraduate degree, you've got to get a PhD. <laughs> yeah, so I was um, understandably nervous when I got to Cambridge University in the UK. And imagine how I felt when many of the professors told me, well, you shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names, that's not scientific, you're supposed to number them. You can't talk about their personality, their minds capable of solving problems, and certainly not their emotions, happiness, sadness, fear, despair. Why? Because those are unique to humans. Well, fortunately as a child, I had a wonderful teacher. And that teacher is a teacher many of you know, it was my dog, Rusty. If you shared your life in a meaningful way with a dog, a cat, a horse, a, a parrot, I don't care what it is, you know perfectly well, we humans are not the only sentient, sapient beings on the planet.
So I didn't confront the professors. I went on talking about the chimpanzees the way they are. And the Geographic sent a filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, Hugo van Lauwek, who I subsequently married. But they sent him out. <laughs> they sent him out not to marry me, but to document, <laughs> to document the, the, what I was discovering about the chimpanzees. And what with my careful descriptions and Hugo's film that began going around the world, science gradually had to accept that the chimpanzees did behave the way that I said they behaved. And they gradually came to change their attitude. And one of those attitudes which really upset me was I was told, you can't have empathy with your subjects. To be a good scientist, you must be coldly objective. And I thought, this isn't true. And that attitude has led to so much cruelty in the scientific world towards animals in labs, for example. So anyway, it was one of the things that I decided one day I was going to try and do something about. I got my PhD. I went back to Africa, went to Gombe, built up a little research center. They were the best days of my life. I could spend hours out in the rainforest I could learn about the interconnection, the interrelatedness of all the plants and animals that make up this complex ecosystem of the forest. And I could spend hours with the chimpanzees and always learning new things. We're now in our 63rd year of study, still learning new things about these closest relatives. <laughs> So why did I leave? I left because in 1986, by then there were six other chimpanzee research sites. When I began, it was just me. And I helped to organize a conference in Chicago, which would bring researchers from these six sites together, mainly to discuss how does chimpanzee behavior change from one environment to another, or maybe it doesn't change. And was there such a thing as culture? Well, the conference determined absolutely, yes, chimpanzees have culture, but we now know that whales have cultures and wolves have cultures. Culture is not unique to humans after all. And so there I was, and I went to that conference as a scientist, got my PhD after all, and I left as an activist because we had a session on conservation and it showed that right across Africa, wherever people were studying chimps, chimpanzee numbers were decreasing and forests were being destroyed. We also had a session on some conditions in captivity and secret film video of chimpanzees in medical research labs, our closest relatives in five foot by five foot cages with bars all around alone these intensely social, highly intelligent beings alone in this bleak, hostile environment. And I knew I had to do something to try and help. I hadn't a clue what to do. So the first thing I did was to get permission to go into some of the labs. I don't know why they lent me, but they did. <laughs> and it was so shocking to see with my own eyes. The reason I went in is because if you want to talk about something, you need to actually have experienced it. It's no good taking what other people have seen. You need to see it for yourself in order to be able to understand and talk about it. So I went into some of the labs and the first thing we did was to get some wonderful students to go in and at least enrich the lives of the chimps, give them something to do, give them things to solve. And it made a big difference, even in the bleak environment of the labs. And some labs changed, and they enlarged the cages hugely, and they let the young ones uh, two or three times a week play with each other. It was a big, big difference. And it's been a long fight, and many animal welfare, animal rights groups have joined the fight. But five, years, five or maybe six years ago, the head of National Institute of Health responsible for about 400 chimps in different labs across America. Francis Collins said, after 
18 months when his scientists came back from examining all the different experiments being done back then. And they were asked two questions. Tell me, he said, is the experiment that you are investigating beneficial to human health? Is it potentially beneficial to human health? And after 18 months, the answer came back. Not one single experiment is either beneficial or even potentially beneficial to human health. And so he said, right, chimpanzees will now stop being used for medical research and they will go into retirement. That was brave because... <laughs> yes. Thank you for the applause because he got a lot of... Um, a lot, he made a lot of enemies among the people whose livelihood depended on doing nasty things to chimpanzees in medical research labs, but he did it anyway. So what about Africa? Well, I got together some money, went to the various study sites, learned a lot about the plight faced by the chimps, the bushmeat trade, the commercial hunting of wild animals for food, the chimpanzees caught hand or foot in a wire snare set by hunters, the shooting of mothers to steal their babies, to send them uh, overseas for sale as pets, circuses, or back then medical research. And I, at the same time, learned an awful lot about the plight of so many of the African people living in or around chimpanzee habitat. And I saw this crippling poverty, the lack of good health and education facilities, the degradation of the land as human populations grew, moved further into chimp habitat, and as their livestock increased in number. It came to a head when I flew over Gombe National Park. It's a small park, the smallest in Tanzania. When I arrived in 1960, it was part of a great equatorial forest belt that stretched across Africa. By the late 1980s, I looked down from a small plain in horror to see Gombe was a small island of forest surrounded by bare hills. More people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, their farmland overused and infertile, struggling to survive. They were cutting down the trees in their desperation to make more land to grow more food or to make a bit of money from charcoal or timber. And that's when it hit me. If we don't find, help these people find ways to make a living without destroying their environment, we can't save chimpanzees, forests, or anything else. And so the Jane Goodall Institute began a program called Take Care or Takari, as it's known. And it's our method of community-led conservation. I think we were the first to go into the 12 villages around Gombe, not as a bunch of arrogant white people saying, well, we we're going to tell you what to do to make your lives better. No, it was a team of seven carefully selected local Tanzanians. And they went into the villages and sat down and asked, what can we do to make your lives better? So, but they said, we want more food and we want better health and education for our children. So that's where we began. And we began restoring fertility to the overused land with what today we would call regenerative agriculture, uh, permaculture. We developed agroforestry. And in addition to that, as people came to trust us, we introduced water management programs. We got scholarships, as many as we could, to give girls a chance for secondary education, because back then there was no chance at all. And we provided family planning information, which was eagerly received because people were beginning to understand one way out of poverty was good education for your children. And they couldn't afford the eight to 10 that was normal for a woman when I first went to Gombe. We provided, um, we provided microfinance opportunities so that people could take out small loans to finance their own small business that was environmentally sustainable. And this has been so successful, it's now in 104 villages throughout 
the chimp range in Gombe. It has six other African countries. It involves some sophisticated technology like GIS, GPS, satellite imagery, helping people to plan their land use and helping us to map the range of chimpanzees and where it most needs to be protected. And so now in these seven countries, the people have understood that protecting the environment isn't just for wildlife, it's for their own future. They need the forest, they need it to stabilize the environment, to regulate rainfall, to regulate the climate. And so they are, have become our partners in conservation. Well, All of this was costing a lot of money. And I was by then traveling around the world about 300 days a year. And I was meeting young people, and I'm talking now about the late 1980s. And I was meeting young people, even back then, who were beginning to lose hope. They were angry. They were depressed. Most of them were just apathetic, didn't seem to care. And so I was asking them, why are you feeling this way? Well, you've compromised our future, not me personally, obviously, but you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. So there's a lot of young people in the audience today. And if you feel we've compromised your future, you're 100% right. In fact, not only have we compromised it, but we've been stealing it from you ever since the industrial, even the agricultural revolution. And we're still stealing it today. So I thought, but when the young people said, there's nothing we can do about it, that's wrong. We had then, and we still have now, although it's smaller now, a window of opportunity when if we get together and make change, we can slow down the climate crisis and we can slow down the loss of biodiversity, which are the two main existential threats that face us today. So that's when I began in 1991, a program for young people. It started with 12 high school students in Tanzania and Dar es Salaam on my veranda. And they were worried about things going wrong in their environment. And I said, well, get your friends who feel the same way. Let's have a meeting. So we had a very, very amazingly important meeting. And we decided that there was something that could be done. There was something they could do. And because everything is interrelated, they would choose projects to make the world better. One for people, one for animals, one for the environment. And we decided that the main message would be, and it's for everybody, and it's the same today as it was then, that every single one of us makes some impact on the planet every single day. All of us here in this theatre, we can choose the kind of difference we make. So that when we go to bed at night, we can ask ourselves, did we make the world a bit better? Or perhaps we made it a bit worse. Let's do better tomorrow. So this Roots and Shoots program uh, is now, now has members from, well, we've even got some preschoolers, but quite a lot in kindergarten, very strong in university, everything in between, even some adults now forming groups, like the staff of a big corporation. And it's in 68 countries and growing. And it's young people who are changing the world. So about eight, nine years ago, we made a video. It's a bit out of date now. In fact, the program's grown so much since then. But I thought maybe you could watch this video and it would give you an impression if you don't know about Roots and Shoots. And there was a, a, some great groups here today, but some of you may not know about it. So let's just have a look at this little short video to give you some idea of what the young people are doing around the world.
be pleased to hear that Roots and Shoots is coming in a big way to Tampa. And <laughs> and one person who is responsible for really making the Tampa Roots and Shoots program grow by developing a what we call a base camp here is Joe Tattlebaum who introduced me earlier today. And <laughs> But we have a wonderful group of Roots and Shoots students who've been working here for many years. And two of them are going to come and tell you what they have been doing to make this a better world. today, especially while Joe is taking her water break, because we love sharing, you know, about our project with you. So my name is Julie Piper, and I'm the Office of the Money Gardener for the University of Tampa's Roots and Shoots chapter. <laughs> and I'm Ashley O'Brien, and I am the officer of the recycling committee of our chapter of Roots and Shoots. So I'm a senior at the University of Tampa. I'm graduating in December. Super exciting. Um, and I'm just, like Julia said, honored to be here tonight with all of you and Dr. Goodall to share a little bit about our chapter of Roots and Shoots over at UT. So besides science and sustainability, my other love is art. And so last spring, when I was given the opportunity to join Roots and Shoots as a leader of our recycling committee, I was thrilled. I was thrilled because in addition to uh, promoting recycling on campus and making recycling more accessible to students at the University of Tampa, the recycling committee spearheads and hosts a recycled art gala every spring. This gala is a dream come true for someone like me who loves being creative but also loves living as sustainably as possible. Uh, we host this art gala every spring uh, on or around Earth Day since 2018. This year, it is on Friday, April 21st. Um, and we started this gala as a way to promote and rally for the creation of a recycling program on campus as we previously had nothing. And we are happy to say that we do now have a, while basic and small, we do have a re recycling program on campus. <laughs> the basic concept of our art gala is we encourage students to submit pieces uh, made of materials that would have otherwise ended up thrown away and in a landfill. Uh, this could be a multitude of things. We've received sculptures made of recycled water bottles, 
collages made of old magazines and newspapers, and paintings made of old oil paints that would have otherwise been thrown away. One of my favorite parts about this gala is being able to see students of all skill levels and all majors use environmentalism and sustainability as inspiration for something so creative. And it's just such a cool way to promote recycling in a unique and creative way. In addition to showcasing our own students' work, we also highlight a keynote speaker each year. We invite a local artist who is using sustainable practices to come and talk to us, showcase their work, and teach us about how we can give back to the environment and being creative as well. I'm so, so thankful that I'm able to share my love of art with not only the student body of the University of Tampa, but also with all of you and Dr. Goodall as well. Thank you. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> so as I said before, I'm the officer for the Learning Garden, and that, that kind of name, you're like, what? What is that? Is it a garden? You, you learn it? Well, yeah, that is what, exactly what it is, actually. So uh, St. Peter Claver Catholic Elementary School is where the garden is. It's like a 15 to 7 minute drive from UT campus, which is where like, you know, our, coll our college is. Um, and I say 15 to 7 because I, it's Tampa and traffic and, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This Tampa Theater was only, you know, eight minutes from campus, but it's actually 20, so, no. So the point of the Learning Garden is to install a love of environmentalism and sustainability in these kids at St. Peter Claver. And that is, you know, the whole point of it is to show them something growing, have them help out with it, and just foster this love of nature that they're going to bring into their lives and hopefully, you know, one day be here like you guys are, you know, caring about the environment and wanting to do something. So... How I got into the Learning Garden, you know, I was a freshman in um, fall of 2020, which I don't know if you know this, there was a pandemic. So when I applied to be the officer for the Learning Garden, I had never seen it. I had seen it in pictures. And so when I went to finally go see it, and um, you know, during COVID, there was no you know, interaction between St. Peter Claver for the safety of the students and the staff and our volunteers. It was just kind of for the best to put it on hold. One thing is you can't really put a garden on hold because um, there's plants there. So, you know, when we started restoration efforts, you know, in fall of 21, I went and it was weeds. And it was, you know, it was the biggest project I've ever seen. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, but it is most certainly the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And it's not something that I did alone. Like, by no means, you know, like I have so much thanks and gratefulness to all of the volunteers who ever came out and helped because I was never someone who was like a team project kind of person. I was like, I'm gonna do it really, really fast and alone and it's gonna be great and awesome. And you cannot do that with a garden. You cannot, I tried. And I am so grateful for everyone who volunteered and showed me that, you know, to make a change and to make this work, we have to work together. We have to be a team. We are all working together. And, you know, the garden, it's, we just got plants in this February, which is so exciting. Yay. And so we got blueberries in, we have a fig, sugar cane, and not one, but two banana trees. And I think that's on theme. That's on theme with us here. So I just... It's such a wonderful project, and it's by no means close to being done, and I hope that, you know, it's, it's something that grows beyond me, because right now, if I'm being honest, I've learned more from this garden than any of the kids at St. Peter Claver have. But hopefully, you know, that changes. So I'm just so grateful for Roots and Shoots and everything that it's taught me, and just the whole organization is absolutely life-changing. So then just, I guess, once again, please give a thanks to all of the volunteers, and a lot of them are here wearing these shirts. They might be your ushers. They've been in the dirt with me. So thank you. Well, thank you. you. I think you can see the enthusiasm and the excitement of young people when they understand the problems and are empowered to take action. So one other thing about Roots and Shoots, it, which wasn't really planned at the beginning, but because we try and bring young people together from different parts of the world, though usually it's mostly virtual because it's just too expensive to fly young people around the world, um, but they're beginning to understand that much more important than the color of your skin 
or your language, or your culture, even your religion, your age, your economic statement, status, is a fact. We are all human beings. We all cry, we all laugh, we all breathe. And so, on the international, UN International Day of Peace, we fly giant peace doves made from recycled sheets in countries that do roots and shoots around the world. And one of my great friends, Dana Lyons, wrote a song for this peace day. So we have, for your enlightenment, for your, your hopefully your excitement today, we have a, a, a wonderful group of roots and shoots who I've had the great pleasure of talking with today with their mentor uh, to fly a giant peace dove, which is now going to come along with a song uh, from the back. I can see them there and they're going to come around and you will all get a chance to see a giant peace dove. <laughs> Well, as you all know, we're living in dark times. We need these peace stubs flying around the world. We need young people with a different vision of the future. We need to bury the guns. We need to bury the guns. So my greatest reason for hope is in the young people of today. The young people who are shouldering the burdens that we have laid upon them and we've got to help them. And we need to help them and we must help them and we must get together to create a more peaceful, a more just, a more sustainable planet. And my reasons for hope, you know, it is first of all, the young people, because what you heard today on the stage, what you saw in the video, that's happening all around the world in more and more and more countries. And so it's not that young people can change the world, they are changing the world, no question. So,
My second reason, reason for hope is this incredible human intellect. It makes us more different from other animals than anything else. And the thing is that we now know, and it started with the chimpanzees, that other animals are way, way more intelligent than we used to think. And that's why I bring my friends here around with me. And, you know, we know, we know that chimpanzees are intelligent and elephants and stuff. Rats, rats are unbelievably intelligent. If you don't believe me, Google five smart rats. But this is Ratty, and Ratty represents a giant, a giant forest uh, rat from Tanzania and other parts of equatorial Africa. These guys are trained to detect landmines. They go across the ground, they make a little scratch when they smell the TNT of the, of the explosive beneath the ground, and a team comes along and defuses the landmine. They have been responsible for clearing landmines from rural Mozambique after the Civil War. They're now being funded by the UN and the US government, I think, um, to remove landmines from parts of Angola. And rats, well, Google five smart rats, and you'll be pretty amazed. <laughs> and, you know, I, I did have Piglet. Piglet, I'm afraid, a little child somehow got hold of Piglet and was so thrilled with Piglet that I never got Piglet back. But the point is that pigs are as intelligent and sometimes more intelligent than dogs. And there's a pig called, not Picasso, you all know the artist, but Pig Casso. And if you Google Pig Casso, Pig Casso was rescued by a wonderful artist in South, America, South um, Africa, in Cape Town actually, and she was on her way to become bacon, and she was rescued. And the, this woman, an artist, noticed the pig was fascinated by her painting. So one day she set up an easel, and she gave Picasso a paintbrush in her mouth. And Picasso went over to the to the canvas, and she started painting. And if you watch Google Picasso, the joy that she shows when she sees a canvas and gets the brush, she even dips it into different colors herself. And her paintings are now being sold for $5,000. She's had two international exhibi exhibitions. Yes. So, okay, Picasso has a name. Every piece of bacon or pork you eat is a Picasso with a personality, a mind, and emotions. Just think about that. And then um, cows. I don't know if any of you have seen, there's a couple of YouTubes of cows also rescued from factory farms, and they play football. You throw the football, they run after the football, and they butt it back with their heads. And they enjoy it, and they're having such an amazing time. So cows who are treated so abominably Every single one is an individual uh, who has emotions, just like your dog or your cat. And then, I'm sure many of you have seen my octopus teacher. And uh, yes, Craig Foster has become one of my closest e-friends. And so this is Octavia, uh, just to show that the octopus, with a brain so unlike ours, a sort of small brain in the, in the, in the head, but most of their brains, their brains in every one of the eight arms. And so we're down to the octopus. And even some insects have been shown to be intelligent. So here we are. But we clearly are more intellectual than any animal. We've designed rockets that go up to Mars, little robots taking photographs of the surface of the red planet. And how is it possible that such an intellectual creature is destroying its only home? And you all know what we're doing to the planet about the pollution and the industrial farming and the use of chemical poisons as we grow our food with, with pesticides and herbicides. And it's that we've lost wisdom. We are highly intellectual, but we're not asking when I make this decision, how does it affect future generations? No, that was the indigenous people, but now we're asking, 
How does it affect me now? How does it affect the next shareholder meeting? How does it affect my next political campaign? We are thinking about short-term gain at the expense of protecting the environment for future generations. And that's children and grandchildren of some of you here. Many of you are young students. You don't have children yet. And the sad thing is many of you are deciding not to have children just because of the kind of world that we older people have landed you with. And it's time we change all that. So... The, But the, the good news is that scientists are beginning to come up with very ingenious uh, technologies to help us live in greater harmony with the planet, like clean energy is just one example. And machines that I've seen, I've seen three of them now, that actually absorb, suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and safely store it underground. And there are many, many others, but Perhaps most important of all, individuals are thinking about their own environmental footprint, thinking about how they live their life each day. Are they wasting water? Are they wasting food? How can you waste food when there's millions of people who are literally starving? And I pass them by on the road, even here in Tampa, and yet we throw food away. When there are people who, one cup of water would make all the difference to life or death and we make ice and toss it down the drain without a thought. But people are beginning to think. And it's groups like Roots and Shoots that really are changing the world because not only are they thinking about these things, but they want to make change and they're changing their parents and their grandparents. And then in addition to that, there is the resilience of nature. I talked about the bare hills around Gombe. If you fly over today, you will see the trees are coming or have come back. And with the trees and the plants comes biodiversity. Insects come back, birds come back. It's not quite the same, but it's very, very different from those bare hills of the late 1980s. And it's getting better all the time. And that's happening around the world. There are so many people now going in for changing this, this uh, industrial agriculture from the huge monocultures and the heavy reliance on these chemicals to regenerative agriculture, permaculture, agroforestry, and so on. And then finally, there's the indomitable spirit. And that's why I carry Mr. H with me, because there are people in the world who are tackling problems that seem impossible to solve. There are icons like Nelson Mandela, like Martin Luther King, uh, many, many of those icons. But we're surrounded by people who've overcome terrible problems in their life. And Mr. H was given to me by a man called Gary Horn. He's 31 years old. He was given to me on my birthday, which is April the 3rd. So he's 32 in a few days' time. And Gary thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee. Gary is blind. He was blinded in the US Marines age 21. He decided for some bizarre reason, which he can't explain, to become a magician. Everybody said, but Gary, you can't be a magician if you're blind. But he lays his props out ahead of time. He does shows for kids. They don't realize he's blind. At the end of the show, he tells them. And he says, you know, things might go wrong in your life because we never know. But if they do, don't give up. There's always a way forward. He taught himself to paint. He gave me Mr. H thinking he was a stuffed chimpanzee. I made him hold the tail. And I said, chimpanzees don't have tails, Gary. <laughs> he said, never mind. Take him with you and you know my spirit's with you. So Mr. H has been with me to 62 countries in 32 years. And I'm sure that many, many of you have, have known, do know people with this same indomitable spirit. And I want to just say, every single one of you in this theater, 
you have an indomitable spirit, but so many people won't realize it. They're afraid. They don't let it out. They don't think, I'm here to make the world a better place. Every day, I can make the world a better place. This indomitable spirit that rises us up and helps us to live up to who we can and should be. So that's the message I have for you. I know we have time for a few questions. Um, I want to thank you for being a fabulous audience. And thank you. Don't go too far away. Just stay, just stay here, right here. Yes, nice and close. Yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Eamon. I'm the leader of the Risa Schuster by the University of Tampa. Uh, and I'm here to read some questions. And uh, by the way, he, he didn't have a chance to say what he does. This is a wonderful young man. And his mentor is a wonderful man that I know very well. Uh, who's in Chicago, and you've been interning with him for two summers, right? So we, we sort of have a mixture. Um, Cree, your mentor, is uh, an African-American, and I've worked with him too. He's a wonderful man, and Ellen is a wonderful man too. <laughs> Um, so all the questions that I'm about to read have been submitted by students who are here in the audience tonight. All right. Uh, first, Luke asks, why did you hide worms under your pillow? I did not hide them under my pillow, Luke. I had them very nicely in my bed. And my, mo my mother said, she came in and I was watching them so intently. She said, you know, Jane, I think you were wondering how do they walk without legs? But you know, small children, remember I was 18 months, they were really curious. And I remember watching a little boy, he was about three years old, and he was watching, you know how snails glide along? And he was watching with a frown on his face, and suddenly he picked up the snail, he popped it on the window pane, he ran inside to look underneath. That's the kind of curiosity that children have. Isn't that lovely? Um, the next question, Jacob asks, what did you like to do when you were a child? Watch animals in the garden and on the cliffs, watch bulls, watch birds, see them sitting on their nests and then feeding their babies, anything to be outdoors. And then, of course, books when it was raining and cold, curled up in front of the fire and reading books about Dr. Doolittle and Tarzan and other animals. Um, Alia asks, if you could thank your mom for her greatest parenting skills, what would you consider those to be? What would you thank her for? I would thank her for supporting my dream when everybody else laughed at me. And I have to say that it's the same for chimpanzee mothers, uh, because we now know, we know, having done 62 years, we can look back and we can see that the mothers who were supportive of their infants, even if the mother was low ranking, she would run and support her infant who got in a squabble with the infant of a higher ranking female, even though it was inevitable she would be attacked by the high ranking mother. And those individuals with supportive mothers, by and large, the males have become higher ranking and the females are better mothers. And I think that same applies to us. And you know, suppose you have, suppose you have a little boy and he's four years old. I'm going to be an engine driver. Well, so often the parents, especially the father, will say, no, you won't be an engine driver. You're going to well, whatever. But support the child and say, wow, you will be a fabulous engine driver. You know the child's going to change. He's not going to go on wanting to be an engine driver when he's been at school, when he's 18. But support the child. Make him feel that he's special. Jane asks, what was it like living with the chimps and do you still spend time with them? I wish I did. I do go back to Gombe, but you know, so often the chimps are high in the mountains and 
being nearly 90, it's not sensible for me to go high in the mountains. Because if I slip and fall and hurt myself, I'll be a horrible burden. And so if the chimps are low down where I could go, they're surrounded by tourists. And the tourists seem to be far more interested in photographing me than the chimps. I think I would be too. <laughs> Cecily asks, why did you choose to leave Tanzania? Do you go back to visit? Well, I think I said, didn't I? Actually, I left because I learned that chimps were, numbers were decreasing and chimps were being mistreated in bad zoos, circuses, and medical research. I go back twice a year, only for about four days. I sometimes see the chimps. Last time I did, three out of four days. Uh, but I spend time in the forest, and that's very important to me. Sadie asks, how did you have so much courage and confidence, and how did you overcome what people said was wrong with your ideas? Uh, well, partly because of my mother, who, you know, supported me and so made me confident. Um, partly because I'm an obstinate kind of person. And <laughs> when I was told I was doing things wrong, well, sometimes, you know, it's not like you're always right. No, you listen to people and sometimes they're right. And in that case, you say, oh, wow, thank you for giving me this idea. But if you know you're right, like I knew the chimps had personalities, minds and emotions. And so I, I wasn't going to give in, I'm obstinate. And it worked. <laughs> Kira asks, what is the most important thing that you have learned during your career? Well, of course I've learned that we're not the only sapient sentient being, and that's very important. I've also learned about the power of young people, the power they have to change the world. I'll tell you one story, which is an interesting story. I was talking to a group of CEOs in Singapore, and afterwards one of them came up to me, had a big international corporation. And he said, Jane, for the past eight years, I've been really, really trying to get my company to behave in an ethical way. In the countries where we source our products, we like to give fair wages, we like to help the community, which is probably struggling in poverty. We try and be fair to the people along the supply chain. We try to have ethical practices and get off the grid in our company's offices around the world. And we treat our customers fairly. And he said there were three reasons for this. One, I saw the writing on the wall that we're using up natural resources too fast in some places for nature to replenish them. Two, consumer pressure. People are beginning to demand products that haven't harmed the environment, that aren't cruel to animals, that aren't cheap because of slave labor somewhere else or unfair wages. But he said, what tipped the balance was my little girl of eight. She came back from school one day and she said, Daddy, they told me that what you're doing is harming the planet. That's not true, is it, Daddy? Because it's my planet. That reached the heart. And that's what we have to do. It's no good accusing people, pointing fingers at them, shouting at them, telling them they're bad and evil. Get a feeling for who you're talking to. See if you can find something in common between you. Maybe you both love dogs. Uh, maybe you both, I, I don't know, but there's usually something. And start with that and then talk to them. Listen to them first because maybe they have thought of things that you've never thought of as to why they do what they do, which you don't agree with. But then find a story because it's the heart you have to reach. I think people, when they really change, must change from within. And so it's no good battering at the brain. People stop listening to you. So you've got to reach the heart and the best way is stories. Our last question, and this one is actually my favorite. Lila asks, what would be your idea of a really, really good day? Well, <laughs> there's, 
different kinds of good days, actually. I mean, one good day would be to spend it by myself out in the forest, or Gombe or some other forest or some beautiful place where I can be in nature and get that feeling of spiritual connection with the natural world. Because, you know, I should say we're all part of the natural world. And not only that, we depend on it. We depend on it for our food, our water, the air, we breathe everything. But we depend on healthy ecosystems. And the ecosystems is what we're destroying. And you know here in, in Tampa about the way that the environment is being destroyed. So another wonderful day, is if I actually have a day and I'm not traveling around the world and I can be with my family, especially in England in the winter when it's cold outside and there's a nice fire and we can just sit and talk. That's another wonderful day. And then I can spend a wonderful day with students, especially Roots and Shoot students, of course. And that is a wonderful day too. And it, it gives me inspiration. It keeps me going. Because, you know, people are always saying, how can you carry on? How can you have hope? Well, I hope I've given you my reasons for hope, but how do I carry on? Because the response that you gave me to what I said today, that inspires me, that gives me energy. You've given me energy. I've given you energy too, I hope, but it's a two-way thing. Okay, well then, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, basically, um, I don't know who's down there. Do we have the last video? We do, okay. So one last video, because I want to prove to you it's not only humans who have an indomitable spirit. This is a video that some of you will have seen but you won't mind seeing it again. I've seen it about 200 times and I still love watching it. <laughs> and we have, Jane Guru Institute has sanctuaries for orphan chimpanzees. We have two. One of them is the biggest in Africa. It's in the Republic of Congo. It's called Chimpunga. And one chimpanzee arrived as a tiny infant, terribly badly wounded by the bullet that killed her mother. And she was confiscated and brought to the sanctuary. And we have a wonderful veterinarian who runs it. Her name is Rebecca Atencia, and she managed to bring the baby back to life. Then when the young chimp was about eight years old, she got really, really sick again. And once again, Rebecca saved her. And we've been given these three beautiful, large forested islands by the Congolese government. And I happened to be there when Wunda was moved onto one of these islands. And it says it in the video, but I want to say it now. This was the first day I met Wunda. I never met her before. And what happened when she came out of her traveling cage was perhaps one of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me. So when you see this, don't applaud, please, because try and imagine what it was like in the silence of the forest with the birds and the crickets and this chimpanzee going into this new world. And just watch what happened and try and imagine how magical it was for me, maybe the most amazing thing ever. So let's see this last film, please, last video. It is a really exciting moment for me. The Jane Goodall Institute's Chimpunga Chimpanzee Rehabilitation <laughs> Centre in the Republic of Congo has for years been caring for infants whose mothers are killed, mostly for the illegal bushing trade. Many of them are now fully grown. Recently, we acquired three large forested islands on the beautiful Kalu River where we can release many of the chimpanzees from our overcrowded center. In the end of Luna, and when she nearly died, but thanks to Rebecca, she came back from the bed, and here she is about to come out into this paradise. 
She's a 15 differently to get her together. And we have probably about 16 now. Today is the first time I met her. I talked to her on the boat, trying to reassure her. She must have known what was happening. None of us could predict exactly what she would do once the cage door opened. It was a very, very touching moment. One of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me. The warmth of her embrace is something I shall never forget. Bawunda and all the other chimpanzees were working to bring here. Chinzula Island will provide a wonderful forest home where they will be careful and safe. So not only did Wunda not only did Wunda survive two near-death experiences, but she was one of only three chimpanzees whose, birth, whose um, implants went wrong. And she gave birth five years ago to a very healthy infant on that island, unaided, and his name is Hope. Uh, everybody, uh, all right. Uh, let's hear a round of applause for Dr. Jay. surprise today. Uh, somebody mentioned that uh, August 3rd is a special day in Dr. Goodall's life. It's her birthday. We're going to bring out Anna Rathman, who is the head of the Jane Goodall Institute. And why don't you say 1,100 people in Tampa thank Dr. Goodall for coming by singing happy birthday to her. What do you think? You're a much better singer than I am. You ready? One, everybody, one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Going to beg a favor of you. Believe it or not, my sister who keeps the house going and looks after me when I get back, she's four years younger than me. Her birthday is on the same day. Could we could we sing happy birthday to her? Her name, her name is her name is Judy. Okay? So one, two, three. Happy birthday to you.
Okay, I'm allowed to say goodbye to you all. But actually, I'm going to ask another thing of you. In Tanzania, where Roots and Shoots began, I found that at the end, when they brought groups from around the capital city or anywhere else to share experiences and projects and have fun and learn from each other, they were standing together at the end of the day and saying, together we can, together we can. And I said, yes, we can, but will we? And so now they say, together we can, together we will. And I say, together we must. Can we do that together? If you believe in it, can we do one, two, three, together we can, together we will, together we must. Thank you. Watch your step, please. Yes, that's my step. <laughs> Happy birthday, David Judy! <laughs>